Moving on to public session. Again, reminding for those in the public gallery, mobile devices, as long as airplane mode, blah, 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 etc. Uh, ask members to ensure that their electronic devices are switched to mute mode to ensure quality of sound recording. Uh, if members are, are content, you can proceed through the agenda. Uh, apologies, none. Uh, remind members that we're obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interests at each committee meeting as applicable. And uh, one member of the committee declaring an interest. Jim, you'll be declaring an interest as well. Uh, draft minutes of the proceedings on the 19th of February 2020. Uh, draft minutes of the meeting on the 19th of February are at page 5. Uh, members, are you content the draft minutes are an accurate record of proceedings? If we're content, we agree those meetings and they will be published on the website. Move on to matters arising. We have some matters arising. Uh, that at the last week's oral evidence session on the overview of central services directed. Officials undertook to have an open, transparent budget, budget process that will include key roles for statutory committees and for the Committee for Finance in particular. <coughs> I'd like to uh, have agreement from uh, the committee to commission Reyes to work in partnership with this committee, developing a written policy with relevant supporting procedures and practices, including templates, that will draw on lessons learned through past experience over the past two decades and will strategically coordinate and focus committee engagement with departments on budgetary matters throughout all phases of the annual budget cycle. And therefore, being the aim to, to improve openness and transparency in budget planning and decision making in Northern Ireland, support statutory committees in fulfilling their budget related statutory roles and responsibilities, and ultimately increase government accountability through informed budget consultation and scrutiny. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to write to the statutory committees to inform them that the Committee of Finance intends to undertake this work and engage with the chairperson's liaisons group uh, as work proceeds. Um, just for um, it's been quite clear through the very truncated process we had with agreeing sort of the, the recent budget process and what we were trying to do and looking at the estimates. There is one of the biggest problems we've had, and I've discussed this with some of the other committees, as many of you have probably done with other MLAs, is that we're not looking at the same data in the same places at the same time. And actually, a standardisation of the information and information flow that was coming through from the departments to the committees would make the process not, much, not only much simpler, but much more open and transparent. And we wouldn't have the issue with black boxes, which seem to be appearing with monotonous regularity in two departments at the same time for the same amount of money. So I think I would like to have your agreement for us to do that, to write to, write to the other committees. Are we so agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, I'd like to draw the members' attention to the correspondence received from the National Crime Agency at page 11 in relation to the committee seeking confirmation on the response to the formal letter sent to the NCA on the 28th of January 2020. I would advise members that first Further correspondence from the National Crime Agency is tabled at page, page 3, confirming that a senior officer from the NCA will be available for an informal meeting to provide an update on the uh, sale of the National Asset Manage Management Agency loans portfolio in Northern Ireland. Uh, I would like to advise members in its letter the NCA requested that members undertake checks to ensure that they have no conflict of interest with regard to this investigation and that they document this formally prior to the session. I think we're content with that. Great. Uh, I need to ask, does any member any interest to declare in relation to this matter? On, if you don't wish to declare it now, please do it through the clerk so we have that available. And if we're content for the committee office to schedule the meeting at the earliest <coughs> opportunity. Okay. Um, I also write letters that a letter from the Minister of Finance was circulated on February the 24th of February, or Monday the 24th of February, as tabled at page four informing the Chair that the Executive intends to announce a budget at the end of the March. I'd like us to seek agreement from the Department with specific details on the price, precise timing of the budget process, including the scope for input by Assembly Committees, and to request detail of the detailed spending proposals from each Department. I'd like you to seek your agreement so that we could seek the agreement from the Department for the monthly forecasting and outturn, outturn data on the outgoing base, ongoing basis to inform future financial scrutiny. Are we content? content. Great. <coughs> I'd 
I'd like to remind members that the Committee asked for a response from the Committee to the Budget Bill and Resources Requirement, and the Committee has received the following two additional responses. Page 22, a response from the Committee for Education and the Budget Bill 2020, and the Resources Requirements and Pressures of the Department of Education. And at page 23 is a response from the Audit Committee on the Budget Plans from the Northern Ireland Audit Office and the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman. Are you content to note both of their responses? Sure. Sir, Pat. Um, just on that... Uh you see on the, the description of the resources for pressures for the, um, the teaching and non-teaching pay, mm -hmm. I noticed that at 1, 148, 166, I, I, I hope that, the, the, uh, we know that there's an outstanding, I'm only asking the question, there's an outstanding dispute going back three years with teachers' pay, uh, and I, I know that that hasn't been settled, so I presume that if the percentage I just heard recently that for every percentage it's equal to uh, is it £30 million pounds for 1% pay rise on that. Now, without that being settled, how does this look or how does this alter as we move forward? Or, I mean, this, this, pay, this pay settlement could be equal to £160 million. Pounds. Mm. Sure, that, that would then have to be reflected in the main estimates. All right. So it's not a concern for us here at the moment now, anyhow, even though we're looking at this. Mm. Okay. Right, just okay. Thanks, Pat. Uh, I'd like to advise members that during his wind uh, last night on the second stage budget bill debate, the Minister suggested that officials come to the committee to engage on questions raised about the sole authority of the Budget Act being used for more substantial costs than is normally the case in black box issues. Look, um, and thank you, Jim, for raising the question yesterday. Uh, I thought I knew the answer until I heard the response from the Minister, um, which propelled my intervention. Uh, and then when I started listening to it, I, and, and, and to give the Minister his due, I don't think the Minister really understood the response he was giving either. Um, and I think we do need to get to the bottom of this. Um, so um, he's informed the House that he asked his officials to engage with the committee on a member. Oh, sorry. And he used the substantial costs as is normally the case in black box issues. I also informed the House that he asked his officials to engage with the committee on a memorandum of understanding, which we've already discussed, between the Assembly and the Executive from the budget process, and agreed to engage with the committee in the coming weeks on the Department's ongoing review of the financial process. Um, members, are we content to ask the Clerk to engage with the Department to schedule these matters for the forward work programme? Mm -hmm. it, it, well, it, yes and no. Uh, Mr Chair, I listened was good. just to what Jim said last night. What well, those black boxes at £400 million pounds in them? Mm. Uh, which is a slight technical issue because the limit's just over a million. Mm -hmm. um, so they're slightly out there. Um, and until we know what's going on, it's very difficult to understand uh, how the budget process is being formulated. I was half hoping, actually, because one amount was in the black box and the other amount was in the main estimates, that in fact they double counted and there was a little pot of money double counted we could use for other things, but I don't think life's as simple as that. So whatever engagement we need to be pretty quick so we actually understand the basis of what we're actually scrutinising. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Are we content with that too? Agree. Great. Uh, we move on to the next stage. Uh, if Mr Allister would care to remove himself from his current seat and move yes, to the other one. Yes. I'd like to welcome Mr Allister to the chair. Uh, I would like to remind members that this agenda item is being recorded by Hansard. Um, I'd like to draw members' attention to the clerk's briefing paper on page 64. Correspondence with Mr Allister regarding the private members' bill at page 67. The function of government miscellaneous provisions bill at page 68. The explanatory and financial uh, memorandum on page 76. The Civil Service Commissioners, Northern Ireland Order 1999, page 82. The Civil Service Commissioners Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2016 at page 86. The Rea's research paper, uh, which I fully commend, and the Special Advisor's Appointment and Conduct at page 88. I just would like to advise members that advice has been sought from the Bill Office regarding the handling of a proposed private member's bill, where the sponsor, sponsor of the private member's bill is a member of the Scrutiny Committee. And the advice is that a member sponsoring a private member's bill may address the committee to discuss their bill 
and take part in a vote on the bill. However, the sponsor should also be advised to declare their interest at such meetings, and an appropriate record of this should be made and retained by committee staff. Further, the advice was said to be consistent with the broad principle that members cannot readily be disenfranchised, but it would be subject to the rules against advocacy. Further advice on declaring an interest should be obtained, if necessary, from the Clerk of Standards and Privileges. Chip, care to make your opening well, statement? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, today, I either enjoy or endure. I'm not quite <laughs> sure which it will be, a different perspective uh, from this seat of this committee, uh, but I'm grateful for the opportunity. I, I would propose, if you think it helpful, to give a brief overview of the bill and then take whatever questions you have. The first thing to say is that, um, for me, the catalyst in respect of this bill was the RHI inquiry. Because as I listened and watched, uh, I'm sure like us all, uh, I was quite appalled at some of the evidence tumbling forth and quite struck by a number of the gaps and deficiencies in our governmental process which was exposed. And uh, that then gave rise to the thought uh, if and when the Assembly came back of seeking to bring forward a piece of legislation which would address some of those issues. Uh, I'm sure it hasn't addressed them all. Um, one of the things to say right at the outset, I deliberately drafted the long title in this bill in a wide perspective so that it, it lends itself to a wide range of amendment, uh, both in anticipation that there may be other things which look different, look more significant, whatever, after our Justice Cochrane report. Uh, and if there is a bill already on it in, its, in the process in the House, and if it's a bill that readily lends itself to amendment, then it becomes a possible vehicle for advancing more expeditiously than otherwise would be the case. Uh, amendments that uh, are changes to the law that need to be made. <coughs> um, insofar as the bill itself is concerned, uh, I view it in three <coughs> different areas. Uh, I think clauses 6 to 11 are very much addressing specific issues that have tumbled out of uh, RHI, uh, matters about recording of meetings, recording of contacts, the presence of civil servants at meetings, the use only of official systems, uh, and the, uh, a register of interest, and the problem of disclosure of unauthor unauthorised disclosure of confidential material. So those are all within the ambit of clauses 6 to uh, 11, and I can expand on all or any of those. The second area of the bill is what comes before that, actually various changes in the law as the law presently stands uh, and that relates to a uh, clauses one to five uh, if i'll maybe just take a quick moment to run through clause one does a number of things uh, the first thing in clause one two that it does is you recall the evidence th that within one party at least there was a hierarchy of spads and one particular individual directing SPADs right across different departments, which seem not to sit at ease with the idea of a special advisor to a particular minister, etc. So at Clause 1-2, uh, I'm seeking to restrict that facility only to the executive office where there's a multiplicity of SPADs. Uh, at Clause so, just to, um, because obviously we've just seen the recent sort of SPADs code that's come yes. out and changes. Do any of the changes within the SPADS code specifically address some of the concerns that you had? Well, yes. Let, let me take you back. Uh, you know, there are, there are things... Sorry, in just for that, that, I'm specifically talking about Clause 1, so if we're, if we're working our way down through the thing. Well, well let me, Yes, uh, can I answer that in two parts? Yeah. Uh, codes of conduct are exactly that. They're codes of conduct. They're nothing more than that. They're guidance. They can be unmade as easily as they were made. They do therefore not compare with legislation. That point was rather crisply made in a case 
in the House of Lords uh, back in 2006, where a code of practice brought in by the Health Secretary under the Mental Health Act was up for discussion and actions taken under it. And Lord Bingham in that case said, it is in my view plain that the code does not have the binding effect which a, standard, which a statutory provision or statutory instrument would have. And that's a truism, but it needs to be stated yeah. that uh, obviously a code Isn't is like useful, it. but it's not as good as a statute. So generally in respect of causes 6 to 11, I've been making the point that whereas a number of those issues have been addressed in whole or in part in the code, uh, the manner of addressing them in a code rather than statute doesn't have the same binding authority. Yeah, and that's the binding authority. Uh, binding the, authority the is what I'm after. Okay. Uh, on, on, the, on whether or not uh, what's in the code changes uh, what is in uh, Clause 1 and 2, I don't think it does. The code says that a special advisors owe a duty not just to the minister but to the whole executive. That's a different concept than one special advisor being able to dictate uh, and uh, form a hierarchy of special advisors across all the departments, or some of them. So I don't think it does conflict with one two. Okay. Um, one three is to introduce a disciplinary process for special advisors. And the premise for that is they're temporary civil servants, they're subject to all the benefits and privileges of the civil service, but the one thing where they stand apart is that they, they're not subject at all to the discipline. And the discipline that the code provides for them is a discipline in the minister's bailiwick, which means that the minister may or may not decide. There's no process outside of that. We had an example of this. You may recall back in the Red Sky controversy where Mr Brimstone uh, was a special advisor and there was unease about his conduct Officials in the Department of Finance were asked to conduct an investigation. They did. They recommended he should be subject to a disciplinary procedure. The Minister of the day simply voiced that. And so Mr Brimstone escaped scot-free, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, if he's a civil servant, I don't think that's right. Yeah. So I would put uh, such uh, spads as civil servants subject to the disciplinary process of the civil service. Um, Can I just digress slightly? Matthew, in your experience working with, um, as a special advisor... I was a civil servant, not a special advisor. Correct. Very keen, That's, very keen yeah, to... Yeah. Talk he was to subject to disciplinary uh, procedures. He was certainly subject to disciplinary procedures, and also, it was also never a Tory. I'm always keen to add that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> not, no, that's not a day Tory, but I sometimes call just, Tory advisor. Just, noticed. I wasn't. Just, just, I wasn't. <laughs> just for the general elucidation of the, sort of, yeah. the committee, sort of special advisors, <laughs> In Whitehall, yeah, were subject to disciplinary procedures because wasn't the head of the civil service? Did they not? They could institute disciplinary procedures against uh, special advisors. So, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not an, a, a, a complete authority in this, and wouldn't claim to be chair. Um, as I understand it, yes, there are um, disciplinary um, uh, routes for special advisors, but I, I don't know the level of codification. I think there is a grey area as well. Um, it's arguable that the, uh, someone who might be quite good at giving evidence is the current permanent secretary of the Department of Finance. Yeah. But I, but so I don't know exactly the level of, um, of codification. But there is, a, I, I, again, there is, I, I, I declare interest bad, because I was aware I was, I was involved in an incident yeah. when a special advisor to a minister was hauled in front of the head of the civil service to be dealt with in a disciplinary procedure. So there are, yeah, I mean, there definitely are procedures, but there, but I, but I don't know the what statutory basis they have, and I'm not sure if they okay. have any statutory basis. Okay. Sorry for yeah. no, no, don't worry. Yeah. I, I was just going through some of the clause one provisions. <clears throat> um, clause one six again is to deal with an RHI issue. The, the, the members will recall there was evidence uh, that after the passing of my first bad bill which was the Civil Service Special Advisors Act of 2013, which removed people with criminal convictions mm -hmm. from the role of SPAD. There was evidence before the RHI inquiry that 
That was circumvented to some extent by parties or a party appointing a person who was not a SPAD uh, who, because he couldn't be a SPAD because of that act, but nonetheless he had full access in Stormont Castle to all the materials and all the facilities that a SPAD had. It, the only difference was he wasn't paid by the public purse. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm seeking at 1-6 uh, to make sure that only SPADs can perform SPAD roles, that the Permanent Secretary would have a duty to ensure that no person other than the duly appointed Special Advisor is afforded by the Department the cooperation, recognition or facilitation due to a Special Advisor. Because I think that if the public purse is paying for people to perform such a role, and I'm not against SPADs at all, I think they have a role to play, but if the public purse is paying for them, I think there has to be parameters. and uh, Because it's a very privileged position where you get access to the very top of papers uh, in the civil service. So that's what one eight's about. Um, clause two is about the number of SPADs. Uh, it's my view that the legal provision for eight SPADs in the executive office mm -hmm. is excessive. Now, I observe that for now, I think only six have been appointed, but the legal facility exists for eight. And uh, uh, I've suggested that should be reduced to four. There's two ways of doing that. Um, the eight is made up of three for the First Minister, three for the Deputy First Minister, and one for each of the junior ministers. So there's two ways of reducing the number. One, you could take away the junior minister's appointee appointments altogether, uh, and you could reduce the first minister and the deputy first minister to two each, or something else. Or the way I've chosen to do it, because drafting wise it was the easiest way to do it, I have reduced the first minister and the deputy first minister from three to one, and then the juniors makes two, makes four. Uh, but there are various mechanisms, and of course, it's a matter which might be open to debate and amendment as to whether four is the right number. Uh, but that's the gist of what Clause 2 is about. Uh, clause 3, again, is caused by a specific situation that arose. Um, MLAs, certainly those who were members of the House at the time, will recall the consternation that there was when it was discovered that for the appointment of David Gordon, there had been an unpublicised amendment to the law mm. of the use of executive powers. And the uh, 1999 Civil Service Commissioner's order was uh, amended overnight, in secret as it were, by a prerogative order of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. Mm -hmm. I'm simply one. I don't think that's a healthy situation. So I want to make any such <coughs> amendment subject to affirmative resolution in the assembly. So as it can't be done behind closed doors, it has to be open. The public are entitled to know if the law has been changed, uh, and uh, that's the very simple premise. And therefore, I would repeal the provision that allowed that appointment. I don't think that appointment has been re-established, but. Um, uh, I would repeal that and make sure any future amendment of that order couldn't be done by pr prerogative powers, but could only be done by uh, affirmative resolution. Uh, cause four is if if there is to be a reduction in the number of spads, then their various rights dictate that they are entitled to some compensation. Those who aren't kept on, and therefore, if you just remit the four. Uh, or remove the office that David Gordon held, uh, there would have to be a compensation provision. And that's in Clause 4 and reflected in more detail in the schedule. And um, I've said that that shouldn't happen until the 31st of March next year to give ample time and ample notice to those who are involved. And then after the 31st of March, uh, people could be reappointed to whatever post then exists. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it's to compensate those who are removed. Clause five is to um, bring the minister, bring the ministers under the same roof in terms of complaint procedure as MLAs. MLAs are subject to the Standards Commissioner, and we have a code of conduct, etc. 
But at this moment, the Standards Commissioner can't take a complaint in respect of a minister. Indeed, there's no real satisfactory route for taking a complaint against a minister. And the last act, or the last uh, action of the Assembly before it collapsed in January 2017 mm -hmm. was to pass unopposed a motion uh, uh, calling for the powers of the Standards Commissioner to, um, to extend the Ministers and to bring in the Ministerial Code under his wing uh, as something to examine whether or not it had been breached. Uh, and that was, as I say, back in January 2017. So that, that's to give effect to that. Now, in New Decade, New Approach, there's a, a very elaborate process about appointing three extra commissioners who do all sorts of things. Um, but it really, it's a bit of a reinventing the wheel, in my view. Uh, why not just simply put it within the ambit of the Standards Commission and save the 120,000 that I think set aside for the extra commissioners? Uh, and put everyone in that same level playing field. The other difficulty I have with the uh, New Decade New Approach document on that score is that at the end of the disciplinary process, if there were one in respect of a minister, whether or not anything is actually done about it is gifted to the First Minister or the Deputy First Minister or whoever the, the leader of the, of oh, the party for the Minister is. So that doesn't seem, uh, seem very f appropriate uh, because it says in one nine the findings will not include any recommendation regarding sanctions. This will ultimately be a matter for the relevant party or assembly process. So it's a bit of a mirage, quite honestly. Um, so those are the changes to the law. Uh, there are changes to the law which I can talk about in the creation of fresh criminal offences, also in clauses um, 9 and 11. But the third aspect of the bill, which I think actually is quite an important aspect, I don't want this bill just to be something that's done in a moment of time. So clause 12 imposes a ruling obligation on the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister to keep under review the functioning of the government. And for example, in any year there will be a number of judicial reviews which will find fault with how government has done things. Uh, there will be reports from commissioners which will find fault. So I'm suggesting in Clause 12 that every two years the First and Deputy First Minister should lay a report for the Assembly uh, on the functioning of government and bring any proposals there are to improve it. Because I don't think we should ever be satisfied with the status quo. If, if things can be improved, then improve them. So this provides a mechanism to provide a framework for doing that. And I think that's of itself quite a useful provision. Uh, I probably, having um, commented, on the, commented adversely on the length of the opening statements of some other witnesses, I've probably said more than enough. <laughs> okay. Um, you're proposing a, a change in the pay structure for... Um, well, I'm proposing a cap. Uh, the code uh, that has been brought in has changed the pay structure and put it in three bands and as an upper cap of 85. I'm saying, uh, I didn't know that was coming in the codes obviously, I'm saying that the cap, there should be a relationship between, because they are civil servants, between the, the salary of a SPAD and a senior grade in the civil service. And therefore I suggested that it should be capped at grade five. And indeed I was taking a look, um, in 70% of countries, according to a publication that's in the library, a advisors' salaries are linked to civil service salaries, mm. and that seems to me it takes it right out of takes it into the civil service ambit. Uh, the new code proposal is an improvement, but I just want to remind the committee of this: 
When Spads first came in, there were two bands. There was an upper band somewhere in the 70s. Overnight, it went to 90,000. 92. Yes, 92. Uh, and that was done by the First Minister and the Finance Minister apparently agreeing to do it, and suddenly it jumped. Well, I think that's not a good thing to be having in the political arena. So I said, link them to the civil service grade. Grade five is a very senior grade. Uh, it seems to me appropriate, but, you know, it's like much in this bill. <coughs> if the House as a whole thinks it's the wrong standard, then there's facility to change that. But it seems to me that that's appropriate. Yes, but um, the, maybe the executive to some extent have pre or the Department of Finance have preempted what you've said because the new appointees have been appointed at considerably lower salaries. For instance, my understanding there were three MLAs, or three, <laughs> of only MLAs, there were three SPADs who were getting by on 92,000 under the old system. Now there's none. And the bulk... Oh, there's four now getting by at 78. Yes, but that, that's a significant drop yep. than what they were getting. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that's a pauper's wage or anything like that, but what I'm saying to you is that have they, has, they, has the Department of Finance not preempted what you're doing? And does that, does that bring the current situation into what you're aiming for uh, as a Grade 5 civil service banding? Well, uh, you know, uh, the Minister in his code has taken some action on this. That's good, because uh, uh, it needed to be addressed. Uh, my problem with doing it in the code is that, as I've already said, it can be unmade as quick as it's made. And we've seen in the past how it was unmade when it was in the 70s and suddenly shot to the 90s. So I would prefer to have a statutory cap linked to civil service pay. And within that, then the code could set the different bands up to that level. But will there, be, will there be SPADs who will have their pay cut from their current announced situation when your bill if it becomes law? I don't think so, because I think the current Grade 5 band extends uh, to in or about the 78 that uh, four of them, I think, are presently being paid. Right. So they wouldn't they need to make provision for compensation for those who may have their salaries reduced? It's a detail of the bill that, at the time when you saw exactly what the Grade 5 ban now is, that might need adjustment, except that. But the principle of whether or not the cap should be set in law rather than in code, I think, is the one that needs to be addressed. Right, OK. Um, <clears throat> uh, so your bill may not actually save any public money at all? Well, Apart from the reduction of the number of um, SPADs from six to four? Well, that, uh, from, from eight to four. Well, there's only six appointed. Yes, but there's nothing to stop two more being appointed tomorrow. Uh, the, the facility still exists. So, yeah, like, at the end of the day, there's going to be a cap set somewhere. I think it's better set in a non-controversial linkage to civil service pay than in a political code which a politician writes, and a politician can change. Thank you. And a totally different issue, the bringing the ministers within the ambit of, of the standards, yeah. Commissioner. I, I think I probably hold the record in this building for the maximum number of complaints made about <laughs> me to standards and privileges. None of them successful, could I yes. say? None, none as a minister, because they couldn't invest. No, they couldn't, but, well. but many of them vexatious. <laughs> Um, yeah. None of them successful. But the point is, that was just me as a humble, lowly, obscure backbencher. Surely, if you bring a minister within the AMTA, you will provoke a massive number of excessive complaints. Because by the very nature, a minister has to make value judgments about school closures, hospital upgrading, etc. Are you not going to pro pro provoke a huge number of complaints coming in on policy issues? It's a fair question, but I think that within the existing arrangements, the Standards Commissioner has a discretion to decree something as vexatious and therefore not to be investigated. So why wouldn't he have that facility on a vexatious minister, a complaint about a minister? But it may not be, it may be, not be vexatious in the sense that it might be, for instance, a hospital closure. Uh, where the local community arise up as one against that decision. 
The complaint would have to be a breach of the ministerial code. It would have to be rooted in something that the Standards Commissioner can rule upon. You just can't say the minister did something I don't like. It would have to be that in doing what he did, what he don't like, he breached the ministerial code. But inevitably, the complainant will make the accusation that uh, he did uh, or she if did. It's, if it's fatuous, then the commissioner can very quickly dispose of it. And then, what do you see as happening to the minister if if there was some ruling that he had breached the code? What you know? What, what well, if a minister breaches the ministerial code, do we think he should be a minister? So you see the ultimate sanction being the power well, I think, to... Recommend. I think the Standards Commissioner would recommend a sanction, as they do with MLAs. So there would be a recommendation for sanction. Uh, it wouldn't be a decision for the Standards Commissioner. Ultimately, that decision is for the Assembly. But how does that sit with the unique situation that we have here, that ministers are appointed under the hunt by their parties? We don't have the situation I have in Westminster, where you have a governing party. We have a totally different structure. How, how, how could a commissioner end up dictating to a party that they'd have to remove the minister? Well, the minister, any party has selection of talent, and uh, therefore, if a minister is found to be in breach of the ministerial code, and the assembly accepts they're in breach of the ministerial code, and the assembly accepts a recommendation that therefore they should not continue as a minister. Why should that person continue but, as a minister? But that leads to the next issue, that if it's brought to the Assembly, inevitably the party concerned will try and block it by petition of concern. Well, one of the amendments I have already in mind for my own bill is to prescribe that you can't use a petition of concern on a Section 5 issue. So you're flagging that up as likely to be coming during the second reading, or the, sorry, the, the third reading of the bill? Right. That's interesting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for oh, your presentation, Mr. Alistair. Um, but in reality, uh, the Minister has already put forward uh, new measures uh, in relation to the Code of Conduct, which have been implemented. Um, and in a sense, is this not a case of really putting the cart before the horse, given that, in addition, that we are awaiting the outcome of the RHI inquiry, which uh, I would probably uh, expect will um, include within it uh, other recommendations that I'm sure will not be ignored by the Minister or Ministers when uh, it comes to the implementation of those recommendations. Well, two or three points there. Uh, we're back to the point I already made that a code's a code, it's not a statute. Uh, and therefore, if you want to give real time, <coughs> uh, you need to have statute. And I do have to say, I think within the public, who were very affronted, I believe, by the evidence they heard at RHI, I think there is a real expectation of significant action to deal with those issues. To simply put matters into a code is good as far as it goes, but let me remind you of this. A number of the matters exposed as being breached in RHI were already in the old code. The old code of conduct required SPADs to conduct themselves with integrity and honesty. It said they should not divulge confidential information. That's paragraph 5 of Schedule 2 of the old code. Yet we had, we had the evidence of a SPAD very flagrantly disposing to family and friends a confidential information. So the fact that it was in a code didn't deliver <coughs> prohibition that we require. By putting it in statute, people can still break the law, but if they're breaking the law rather than a code, they're doing something much more significant. And that's why at Clause 11, I want to create the specific offence of distributing information effectively to family and friends, which is confidential. Now, all spats are caught by they're covered by the Official Secrets Act. But the Official Secrets Act really deals with high-level national security issues. Um, if, you, if you really want to create a deterrent to a repetition of what happened 
then certainly put it in the code, but you need to have the criminal deterrent of an offence, uh, which says that if you're caught distributing information, there's a penalty here. That's really what gives it bite. So I'm making a couple of points today. I'm saying the old code and the fact that they were infringed demonstrates a code isn't enough, and particularly on that important issue, will require criminal sanction, I believe, as a real deterrent. So that's why I think it needs to be in a bill, it needs to be in an act, not just in a code. Well, I noticed that you haven't uh, commented on the RHI inquiry in terms of Sorry. but can I, can I just include in this now, whenever you, you've raised that point, that what one is talking about here is not the efficiency of the code in itself per se, but whether or not it was enforced. Uh, and clearly, I think that, that might have been where the problem was, and you imply that it only will ever be enforced as a result of having sort of a, a criminal uh, conviction. Uh, pending or the likes of it where uh, a person has breached the code. But is it not the case that uh, in, uh, the, uh, in, in, in the case of the, of the Minister, uh, proposals for enforcement arrangements uh, that would give investigative complaints to an independent commissioner, including the Commissioner for Standards, go much beyond what is even that you suggest, whilst you would argue that uh, the difference in the code is the very fact that it doesn't carry with it an enforceable penalty, per se. Well, that, that's the real point. Nothing in a code can be more effective than something in legislation. And I do think that in all walks of life, the fact that a person is tempted to do something they shouldn't do, the temptation is harder to overcome. Uh, the, you know, the, people tend to think twice if they know they're breaking the law, or most people do. So I think by putting it in the law, you give it that elevated imprimatur, which makes it very clear in flashing lights, you don't do this. Because if you do this, then you're, you're at risk of paying a criminal penalty. The point about uh, RHI might have come along with other things. Of course it might. I'm sure it will. But the very point I made at the beginning is this bill with its wide, long title can be a vehicle for adding multiple amendments to deal with multiple situations. And uh, therefore, any member, yourself included, can pick up on something in RHI or somewhere else and say, why don't we include in this bill such and such. Why don't we put that in? Uh, so, because Lord Justice Coughlin has found that, you haven't dealt with us, Mr Alistair, so can we put it in? Yes, we can. Bring an amendment to that effect. Uh, and if the House agrees it, then it's in. Uh, mm -hmm. That, I think, is the best way, from the starting point, that the best way to deal with this is legislation. Because it's superior to a code and this is legislation which lends itself to elasticity in terms of what you can put into it. Thank you. Okay. Well, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and yes, Jim, I suppose, um, in the spirit for which you bring this bill, I actually have a lot of sympathy for you. Uh, I think that we're in a new age. I think that that necessitates that we have, as MLAs, a real duty to ensure that people behave appropriately uh, and that there are strict controls uh, with regards and around individuals so that there can be no abuse of what is actually democracy. And it's very fragile democracy here and we have to make sure that we garner and protect it. So, I have, you know, we are in a new age, we certainly are in a new decade. Uh, it remains to be seen whether business is conducted in a different way, we hope it is. Uh, so this, I believe, is, is part of that process. Uh, and it's good that we can debate the issues. So I, I, I come in a spirit of generosity and, and sympathy with regards to your bill. But? Uh, but, of course. Um, <laughs> on Jim's point about standards, uh, the, the Commission for Standards, again, I have been subjected to 
scurious claims that went to the Standards Commissioner all nonsense, uh, on at least two occasions. And it's still something to deal with as a representative, and it's still something that the Commissioner for Standards has to has to judge or test. Uh, and while whilst that may be a quick process, and, and it's quite clear that sometimes complaints go in and they're just nonsense, and that may be something that can be judged very quickly. There's still that process, that burden of process, and sometimes that investigation has to then await a third party investigation, maybe outside of this place, and then that process takes a lot longer also. So as an MLA, as an uh, elected rep, you could have these things hanging over you. Now, it's the process, because these things are all... So, Jim's point about a minister making a very tough decision, which have to be taken. Now, uh, there can be no excuses for kicking cans down the road. So, there are going to be very unpopular decisions made by ministers. And whilst you are correct, it might not be breaking the ministerial code. <coughs> it has already guessed that there still could be petition-type complaints putting in, ranging to the hundreds, on a particular person, a minister who makes a decision. Um, how do you square that? How, how, do you st how do you stop the burden of process to a Commissioner for Standards when there could be really good, really specialist and indeed vital investigations that he should be taking forward, but he can't because he's bogged down with a hundred petition type uh, complaints? Well, a yeah, fair enough point. Uh, maybe then what the bill needs is an amendment to enhance the powers of the Standards Commissioner to weed out what doesn't pass the mustard mm. in terms of initial complaint, and maybe strengthening his powers in that regard would be useful both for Ministers and MLAs. So I would have thought that it's perfectly possible to devise an amendment which would give a direction of travel to strengthen that filter. I agree a filter is necessary. Um, but whether it's right or wrong to do it, I think you have to measure it against what we have, and what we have is pretty farcical in that regard. And I think you have to measure it against the fact that this accords with what this assembly three years ago approved. An emotion, and uh, you know, there, it doesn't. It didn't. All those arguments that have been made didn't cause a single MLA to cause it, call a division on the motion, and to vote it down. Uh, so it comes with the standing of having been considered and approved by the assembly itself in the passing of a motion. But yeah, I, I'm very open to the idea that. Uh, strengthening and imposing a proper filter uh, would be a bonus in terms of dealing with the threat of vexatious uh, claims. Uh, I, I want to then turn <coughs> to uh, Clause 9 and 11, I think it is, the criminal offences. Mm -hmm. uh, now again, I, I see where these are born out of. I, you know, following the RHA inquiry and, and others uh, investigations, I see where I see the rationale. But clause nine, if we take clause nine first, if I can find it. So clause nine it should be a, an offence for any minister, civil servant, or special advisor when communicating on government business by electronic means, electronic means, sorry, to use personal accounts or anything else other than departmental systems and email addresses. Mm. So, in our very busy lives, working long hours. I have two email addresses on my phone. It just happened to be last week that when I searched for an email address, I put the content of the email within it, I hit send, and I realised, my goodness, that I sent that on my personal account. Not that it was a big thing, but I really wanted to communicate with this person through my, my email account or my MLA account so that my staff would pick it up. Because yeah. they wouldn't have access to me, my personal email account. Now, again, could it be construed as something like that, either by a minister or a, 
a spad or civil servant, <coughs> could could they then end up having a criminal offence or a criminal sanction? Well, that's why we've got nine two. Yeah. Nine two says it is a defence for a person charged with an offence under subsection one to prove the person had a reasonable excuse mm-hmm. for the failure. So, yeah. What is a reasonable but, excuse? Let's take an example. A minister, a special advisor, they're <coughs> out and about. Some something unexpected happens. Uh, they only have their personal access to their personal email or their mm-hmm. whatever electronic device. They need to do something. They do it. Yeah. That's not targeted at, at, the, at this. This is targeted at the deliberate avoidance of using official systems in order to hide things, such as we saw in the RHI. So, uh, and therefore, the person in the example I've given uh, would never be prosecuted because of the reasonable excuse defence. So a mistake is a reasonable excuse? Could be in those circumstances. Mm-hmm. Because of an electronic device with two or more emails within well, it? Well, I think you would have to demonstrate it was a mistake, that this wasn't a convenience. Yeah. How do you demonstrate the mistake? Well, like in any, uh, at the end of the day, these are all what, what we call jury questions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's for a jury, as it were, to decide, do I believe him or do I not? It's a classic jury question, yeah. um, and um, uh, that's where it would lie, but yes, that's right. And it has been mentioned to me that why have I not got the reasonable defence provision in Clause 11 about unauthorised disclosure, and it's been suggested to me that that could be a discouragement to whistleblowers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's right, but uh, I'm more than willing to consider the reasonable defence inclusion in Clause 11 as well. Hmm. I'm going to come on to that, because yeah. uh, I'm interested in Clause 11. Staying on Clause 9, Yeah. Uh, we know with our HI inquiry that when the judge requested information, it was all information. It hmm. wasn't ministerial official information, hmm. it, wasn't, it was all personal data also hmm. that had any link- linkage at all with our HI. Um, so is that not a defence in itself? In, in, in the fact and knowledge now that if someone sends an email, no matter what, through what guise or what function or, or machinery, it's going to be picked up? Well, in the circumstances of a statutory RHI type inquiry, yes, but I do remind you, in RHI, it took a long time to unearth some of that. Some of it wasn't volunteered till cross-referencing showed it existed. And only then was it reluctantly handed over. So, you know, no matter what the law says here, there will be people who get away with breaching it. But it's by putting it in the law that you create the sanction and the deterrent from doing it. And uh, I think that it's better in the law than not in the law. Is, is the tariff correct? Well, obviously I toyed with that. Uh, I don't think... It's not the most serious offence of the criminal calendar, so I thought it was... I picked two years because that gives that probably puts it into the ambit... Um, well, it gives you the option of putting it into the ambit of the Crown Court as opposed to the county, as opposed to the uh, Magistrates Court. The summary conviction where the max is six months would be for something relatively modest. If it's a bit more serious than that, I think it should go into the uh, Crown Court on indictment, and two years is sort of the bottom level you'd experience there. Mm-hmm. Um, in my first draft, I put it at five, and then I thought it's maybe a bit high, <laughs> so uh, I brought it back to two. But again, that's the sort of thing that, uh, at committee stage and otherwise, the bill gets there, uh, can be teased out. Yeah. Um, just, just a, just one. Uh, one of the issues is the use of servers, sort of government information yeah. on non-government servers and obviously things like trim and government services are protected to the degree that uh, sort of uh, individual or private party servers aren't. Mm-hmm. So obviously within Nine are you also looking for the banning of any official information being passed on to non-governmental servers? I am and I looked in that regard as to what the new code says to see had it got a, had it yeah, captured yeah. It in a better way. It says simply special advisors must use official email systems. Um, mine I think is a bit 
wider than that. But yeah, look, I don't hold myself out as a, an electronics expert. If this bill gets beyond second stage, I anticipate talking to somebody of particular knowledge on these things to make sure it is watertight. But uh, the thrust is quite clear that you can't go around in an official job hiding stuff in private emails or private devices or anything else. You have to use the official upfront system so that if anything is ever to be investigated, it's there. And we don't have the scenario that we had in RHI where people chased their tails within that inquiry for months trying to honor <coughs> their emails. In the end, they got to them. Well, we think they got to them. Oh, but, um, you know, if you're doing an official job and there might be motive for hiding things, then you want to build legislation that discourages you mm. from doing that. Good, sir. Then, on, on clause 11, then, and, and yeah. I, I, see, I read the first line, without prejudice to the operation of the Official Secrets Act 20, or 1911 mm -hmm. to 1989, it shall be an offence. So I take it that's in there for a reason. Can you explain the, the reason? The reason is that a uh, because bad... Uh, are subject to the Official Secrets Act. Mm -hmm. There might be a case where that would be the correct vehicle, uh, and therefore uh, that should be available. But if in certain circumstances where it wasn't the right vehicle, then this might be the right vehicle. So without prejudice to the fact that you might have a Official Secrets Act question here, mm -hmm. uh, you, you can go for them on what in essence is probably a lesser offence. Uh, of the the unauthorised distribution of sensitive material, so that's simply why it's it's phrased like that. Uh, on the on the official secret sect, you I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the Catherine Gunn case, mm -hmm. British intelligence specialist mm -hmm. who whistle blew on on um, NSA stuff coming from over the over the Atlantic from America, yeah. uh, and and the trial. Then that she went through and then packed that had her knife. Surely uh, you can't help but have sympathy for someone like that, even though they break the uh, allegedly break the Official Secrets Act. So is there danger that, as you've already alluded to, and I would probably have sympathy with this argument that Clause eleven would may well then prevent whistleblowing incident whereby a spad coming across something that they see to be very harmful or dangerous, reckless to democracy or to people or the population, uh, that would prevent them or, or stop them? From well, uh, uh, a, a journalist raised that issue with me, and I've been mm -hmm. thinking about it, I'm conscious of it now. So I think that is justification for putting in the lawful excuse defence mm -hmm. into Clause 11. So again, at consideration stage, I'd anticipate moving an amendment to that effect specifically to protect whistleblowers. I'm not entirely certain it's necessary, but better to be sure than sorry. But even without this legislation, someone like Miss Gunn could be charged under the Official Secrecy Act and still go through all that yeah, yeah. Mm. difficulty. Yeah. This doesn't ameliorate that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, there may be some gap between what would be classed as the Official Secrets Act procedures and then you know, with, with on information, depending on maybe, maybe depending on the information at hand yeah. or what needs to be leaked. Uh, but but surely we, it's probably just my libertarian hat on. But we really want to be allowed to to out information on practices that could be harmful to the population. Uh, so I would I would mm. worry about that clause. Uh, but well, do you not think the the reasonable excuse would be? Yeah, yeah, that might that it. might tie it up. That might that might work. Uh, See, I should say, like, you have the Official Secrets Act, you then would have this, and then you have a sort of catch-all common law offence of misfeasance in a public office. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which is there as sort of a catch in common law terms, but the statute law doesn't catch. Mm. Mm. And again, I question the tariff on this, uh, and again the differential. Uh, but again, Again, with time, with time to to journey. I thought this was a more serious matter than using an unauthorized device. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I thought the tariff sh could take it into the the realms of being a serious criminal matter. 
Okay. That'll do me, Chair. I look forward to scrutinising the bill. Close by close. Okay. Matthew. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, um, Jim, for giving us yeah. evidence on it. Um, just a few definitional questions. What is a meeting, as, as defined by the bill clause? Six refers to records of meetings. Could you give us a sort of, well, this is a meeting. Uh, when two or more people meet, it has the capacity to be a meeting. So it's something attended by a minister and a third party, obviously. Um, there's some obvious ones, like if you sit down with your civil servants, uh, if you sit down uh, with a business group, you're having a meeting. Yeah. Um, if, if at a, if a minister was at a public reception, um, for the sake of argument, say it's at a university or a yeah. trade group or something, someone pulls them to one side and says, Minister, I just want to collar you about X policy. Yeah. Um, their private secretary isn't around, um, or the private secretary, it, sort of what, for whatever reason, can't get into that conversation. Yes. What is, is the, who is at fault under well, this act and what's I the... I think that situation is caught by Clause 7. Because Clause 7 says ministers and special advisors must well and retain records of all meetings they hold with non-departmental personnel about departmental matters. So, if you're in an unplanned situation yeah. and uh, you're collared about something, yeah. uh, that could be, on one view, a meeting, uh, but you've no civil servant, you've nothing else or, or anyone else with you, so you simply log it mm -hmm. and retain any record you have of it. Log it as in give a written note yeah. or a verbal briefing to your private secretary? Yeah, yeah. And, and, that, and that would yeah. include basically any contact at all that somewhere well, It might be last night I met the chairman of Invest NI, he raised with me, we need to do X, Y and Z. Yeah. Mm. Would you look at that? Or uh, I met somebody who says we shouldn't be proceeding with that legislation because it could hurt some sector of industry. That might be a more dubious thing, uh, but certainly should be recorded. But it doesn't strike a somewhat onerous a require a legal statutory requirement effectively for a minister to log every single conversation he has with anybody who asks him about well, departmental the new code says the new code at paragraph 13 says special advisors must keep accurate official records including minutes of relevant meetings and handle the information as openly and transparently as possible so like, even the new code is saying you need to keep a record of who you meet but it doesn't, what it doesn't do is, first of all, it's not statutory, as you've said, but nor does it create a specific obligation that seems to catch almost any interaction that a minister might have that could plausibly cover departmental business. He could be in, he or she could be in a local coffee shop or supermarket. Yes, but and obviously, you know, if he's discussing departmental matters, uh, which could have a bearing on the future shaping of policy or decision making, Shouldn't there be a record of that? How would you say, how would, how would it be dealt with if, for the sake of argument, we were talking about vexatious inquiries earlier on, if for the sake of argument someone who was politically opposed to the minister in question or had a specific policy disagreement with them, if they were, say for the sake of argument, they lived close to them and they met them in the supermarket and they met he or she, ex-minister, and said, I'd like to chat to you about why the minister says, uh, fine, but you'll have to go through the department send. Can you, you know, email or get in touch with the department? X person then says, I had a 10 minute conversation. I asked the minister to give me, to do X, Y, Z for me, and they agreed. The minister then hasn't. You mean they lie about it? They lie about it. They lie about the minister. Well, they're all subject to being lied about. Um, uh, how do you legislate for that? The minister in that circumstance might be well advised to put in a note, uh, Mr. X approached me, but I refused to discuss issues with him. So but there's a record. But does it? I suppose my question is: in addition to the administrative burden, does it create an, an, an incentive for vexatious people who know that there is now a statutory obligation on every single minister to record basically every single interaction he has that could conceivably touch on departmental business? Hmm. I don't think it's very burdensome in our modern technology 
to record a one sentence reference to a meeting. Uh, could it encourage malevolent contact for the sake of saying, is it recorded? Anything could, but I'm not sure. But it's a question of balancing. Is there a mischief here that needs to be addressed? And if there's a mischief here that needs to be addressed, then you address it with the knowledge that there could be spin-off of inconvenience, but which is more important, addressing the mischief or, or the avoiding the inconvenience? Just before I come on to the next, what specific bit of mischief, is there a specific bit of mischief that has been alluded to in the RHI Farago that you're, that you're trying to address? Well, there was, there was a lot of evidence uh, and suggestions of meetings. Mm -hmm. There was one, if I recall correctly, where a finance minister met with Moy Park, but there's no record. Um, well, I think there should have been a record of a minister meeting uh, Moy Park management. I agree. I mean, I agree with the, certainly agree with the principle of that. But I suppose my concern would be that there's a creating this. I think just for a sort of a matter of record, when we're discussing, because the RHI report is due on mm. the yes. 13th of March and specifics, because no, we don't know the specifics away, within specifics it. Towards the general specifically, when we're mentioning sort of companies and individuals that may be subject to other action, I think it's appropriate yeah, that we point shape point ourselves point away from that. Um, and then. Just to go on to some of the other um, clause nine, I've, I've been going through as we've been discussing and breathing a sigh of relief because although I was a UK, not a Northern Ireland civil servant, I probably would have been done time for some of the provisions in this bill. So, <laughs> <laughs> may or may not be your attempt. Maybe that's a sign that I would have done. Um, Better respect of clause then, Jim. Indeed, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thankfully, you, know, so, thankfully this, you can't let it slip for a white tall. Um, but, but I suppose my point is not that I think I did anything. Um, uh, in any way, um, even that breached the civil service code, but on use of official systems, further to what Paul said earlier on, it's pretty regular for, I mean, if I went into my hot mail now, I'd probably find umpteen emails that were yeah. covered official business that I did. Um, now, um, is it the case that, that government department, um, do you think, is it, is it right to put something like as routine as using, to, to even create the possibly chilling effect for a civil servant that if they use their Hotmail or their Gmail once, they have to construct a reasonable defence. Is that, would that be an impediment to just the ongoing daily good kind of good government that someone thinks that I, I have to send something quickly via my Hotmail or I have to WhatsApp someone about, I have to WhatsApp the minister to be at a departmental meeting at a certain time. I can't just do it knowing that in an ideal world I'd use my departmental email. I have to think, I'm doing this with the knowledge that I might have to construct a, a reasonable excuse defence. Well, I think we should always remember there can be no prosecution unless it passes two tests. One is a reasonable prospect of conviction, the other one should be very important here, that it's in the public interest. So I would be very surprised if there's any prosecutor who thought that Matthew O'Toole, Minister of whatever, uh, our special advisor of whatever status uh, used his WhatsApp to tell someone there was a meeting in half an hour's time, therefore prosecute him. Like, no one would think that's in the public interest. So that would be a vexatious prosecution in itself. So that wouldn't happen. So I, I think you're back to the question, is there a mischief to be addressed? I think RHI shows there is a mischief to be addressed. There was deliberate, conscious deployment of non-departmental systems to keep things off systems. So, if that is so, do you need that to be a criminal offence? I think you do, and I don't think you should. That need is dissipated by thinking up of very innocent examples where that would be too onerous, because that which is too onerous wouldn't get past the public interest test. Is there a risk that in legislating in this way, you incentivize sort of even, kind of in a sense, even more malign or mischievous types of contact, such as 
um, phone calls, complete, you know, stuff that can be um, phone calls, in-person verbal briefings, that is even harder in a sense to get at. Is there a risk of incentivizing, mean, understanding? I mean, the hapless minister been set up with something like that? Yeah. <coughs> well, like, you, you mean someone rings him on his personal phone? Well, I suppose... And gives him some information or whatever, asks him to do something, and he talks to them on his own private home line. Both that, but also if clearly the intent of this bill, and one that I'm sure lots of us would agree with, is to disincentivise um, people um, mischievously, um, mischievously uh, seeking to avoid FOI and other official, you know, kind of... Um, channels to, in order to do things that might not be um, desirable. Do you, by creating a specific statutory sanction, in a sense incentivize people to just not put it on email at all, where and, and then they you drive kind of behaviour which is, in a sense, even more kind of harder to regulate. It's people having private conversations. It's things not going on email at all. See what I mean? Well, that was one of the problems in RHI, it would seem, that, and you know, you had the spectacular evidence of the head of the civil service saying it was uh, agreed that notes wouldn't be kept for certain minutes because they would be FOIable. Yeah. Um, well, I want to, by making sure notes are kept, you know, cause six, cause seven, etc., make sure that we put an end to that. I don't think that we should be discouraged from doing the right thing to address those particular mischiefs by worrying unduly out of whether they're open to exploitation by miscreants who could set a minister up for a breach, which frankly will never be prosecuted because it's been in the public interest. And then just if I may, Chair, on the, off the offence sorry, of um, unauthorised disclosure, um, you mentioned the media before, I suppose, and you may have given consideration of this in terms of amendments, but would this, this would seem to me, as currently drafted, to capture many forms of communication with the media, um, including informal briefings about the thinking of Minister X on issue Y, much of which I happen to think is sort of routine business of politics, um, and in fact helps the media do a better job in terms of holding um, ministers to account. Is there, a, is there a concern that, I mean, lots of people here will have read Sam McBride's book and admired his... Never, never. his um, his, his rigour, but also you know people in Spotlight and other journalists in Northern Ireland. Is there a concern that what you what, what you actually end up doing is making their jobs harder, and they're the people who've been, in a sense, the most effective at holding um, ministers in the political class here to account? I, I can see the point you're making, that um, in modern government there's a role for press briefings, etc. Uh, so, yeah, maybe... Maybe a suitably framed amendment, although one would have to be careful with it, um, as to exempt um, authorised briefings. I think it would be important to ensure they were authorised. Mm. Authorised briefings. Authorised by the Minister? Yeah. So we have at the minute, I mean, we have in London, as people will see at the minute, a, an example uh, of, a, um, of an advisor who is... Um, extremely uh, enthusiastic about confidential, sensitive, yeah. off-the-record um, background briefings to, to media to suit his agenda. Um, now, effectively, now, though we might think that's, we might disagree with what he's saying, and we might, or we might agree with it, but we might think it's, you know, not a great way to do government, but in a sense this seems to me to be putting that, to make, making that illegal in statute in Northern Ireland. Um, so I would have a bit of a concern about that. Well, look, uh, I think you bring up points which makes a meeting like this useful, and certainly I'm, I'm more than happy to take that discussion forward with you and other members about, because, you know, I want this bill to be as good as it can be. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I'm not the fount of all knowledge on any of these things. So, I yeah, mean, I, do, I do think, I think two amendments there might help, the, given Paul's point and your point. One about the public uh, uh, reasonable excuse and one a, so properly crafted about uh, press briefings. My, the specific scenario I see is if a political journalist, for the sake of argument, yeah. um, is investigating, um, let's say for the sake of argument, an incompetent or a um, possibly even a corrupt <coughs> minister, I'm obviously talking completely hypothetically, um, uh, and if they are <coughs> they're doing that, ex journalist is sniffing around that story, the special advisor <coughs> who works for that minister. Um, thinks, you know what, they're right, and I want to, I, I want to be helpful to them. I don't obviously want to do that. Through, I don't want to be authorised by the minister in question because I want to give a background nod to the, to the journalist in question that they're on the right lines. And I might want to do that via WhatsApp, or I might want to do that via phone call. Then, then they'd, have the, they'd have the problem of paragraph 12 of the, special, uh, of the existing code. Special advisors shall not disclose official information. Uh, yes, but that's not on the statutory footing. No, but uh, well, it's in the code. So you're looking for a halfway house between whereby he could break the code but not break the law. No, but I think there's. A, I mean, you said yourself at the beginning that the purpose of this is to put another statutory footing and to yeah. create that yeah. very robust uh, yeah. masonry around the whole thing. Now, clearly, what that does is it. The whole point of moving from codification to proper statutory, you know. Um, Established strategy basis with criminal sanction is that you create a chilling effect on certain types of behaviour, and it may be that the codification is contains a degree of flexibility around certain types of behaviour for good reason, because making that more strenuous would have a, in a sense, a perverse or unwanted effect. Of, um, uh, I understand the line you're taking. Um, I think it's the most important. Really. It's matters I'll take away and think about, and certainly discuss with you. Yeah, further, I'm certainly not. Closing the door on any of that. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, just, just on one of Matthew's Draw points one, please, about uh, uh, clause seven, uh, the making notes. I, I actually I think this is a really good one. I think it's essential. But does it also? Are you having in mind the times when, after ministerial question time, you rush out and grab a minister, uh, put your arm around him as you as you both walk to his office? And you, and you basically say to him about a constituency issue, him already, or her, head frazzled with question time, and him getting him getting to his office, closing the door on you and saying, Good, thank goodness he's away. Is that the type of thing you're talking about, where you have the quarters of power, if you like, the, the where it all comes from, whereby you're walking with the minister and trying to ingrain into the minister your thought process? Well... It, it wasn't exactly what I was thinking of, but it probably would be captured by this. I'm thinking more of the probably more sinister side of things, where someone with vested interest um, persuades a minister off record, as it were, yeah. that something should be done. I, I agree with you now. And then the minister doesn't does or doesn't do it. Yeah. Uh, and there never is a record of contact whatsoever. I'm trying to create a situation where that sort of lobby exercise would have to be referenced. Which uh, I agree with. Could, that, could the MLA guess it could? So, so you imagine you've just got a minister who's just done an hour and a half or whatever, or 45 minutes of a question time, maybe even a debate mm -hmm. motion, and you've grabbed him. You've churned a lot of stuff out to him. He's listened to about thirty percent of it. He's got into his <laughs> office, shut the door, and well, my experience of that is he would say, "Drop me a note about that." Yes. So you imagine that yeah, he would say that. Then you, you then and, and nine months later in a debate about something that has went wrong policy ways. Remember the day I told you, Minister, about that? And then you stand up in the assembly and say, "Remember, Minister, you you're a liar because yes. I met you on such and such a date." You know, no, you see minister, sir, no minister would ever be a liar. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's not how things happen in Northern Ireland. You, you understand where I'm saying? So uh, I've, I've adopted you quite a lot, yeah, yeah. Deputy. Sorry. I understand the point. I think that um, you know, if there's something of substance attaching, I think you'd expect a record. Today, met with Paul through, we discussed the future of Sony. Ah, yeah. 
Good subject. Good subject. Uh, I refer you to our previous conversation. <laughs> um, I still think it's right that those should be recorded. Okay. So, Pat. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much, Mr. Allister. And uh, no doubt there's been a lot of work in all put into this. But um, look, I'm just going to ask you on, from your point of view, um, as we look at the the reduction of the special advisors and the impact that may well have on the work of the executive and the expertise required in bringing those provisions, taking in mind of Clause 2, to reduce the number of your special advisors. I mean, I personally, um, uh, I mean, I can agree probably with the cost saving and, um, on that, so uh, I'd just like to maybe tease, uh, tease that where you find that. But is that expertise lost? Well, the way I came at this was this. I looked at the number of special advisors in this jurisdiction and then looked at the other devolved institutions. And when I saw that Wales had the same number for its entire government, as the First Minister and Deputy First, First Minister, Minister have in their office. I thought, there's something seriously wrong here. How can a whole Welsh Government survive with eight special advisors and the um, <coughs> First Minister and the Deputy also need eight? So it seemed to me to be just too much of the jobs of the boys about it, to be frank. And uh, I thought that it would be appropriate to reduce it. I've suggested reducing it from eight to four. There might be other views. If the current appointment of six is a settled view, then I think there is acknowledgement from the appointees, appointing ministers themselves that eight's too many. Um, but I think that it is. It's already set down in the registration the number that they can have. So I think it's appropriate, if we think that's the wrong number, uh, to set the alternative number in the registration. And four seems to me to be adequate. If the House thinks six, then the House will think six. If the House thinks eight, then it will not prove cause two. And uh, in that, I mean, I haven't checked it. I haven't probably the time in order to do it. Is there a difference in the salaries which is paid here, in this year, in Northern Ireland, as compared to Wales? Mm -hmm. and yes. to <laughs> Uh, ours traditionally have been the most expensive. Um, now these figures obviously change as time goes on. But the last year that we had the cost of special advisors in Northern Ireland was 2015-16, when the cost was just over £2 million. In 17-18 in Scotland, the cost was just over £1 million. In Wales, it was in 1819 a million pounds, just under. So, before this place collapsed, we were already paying twice for special advisors for what was being done in England, in, in Scotland, and Wales. Yeah, and I suppose on that, I mean, we're we're all committed. I hope anyhow to good governance and transparency in government, and um, take, and not to mention RHI, but just looking at the lessons of RHI, and we all want to do better, and there's no doubt that that is one way of doing it, but there's, uh, the support for the reduction of the number of SPADs would go a long way to do that. Do you think that would help that uh, transparency, if you like? I want to come back on just to the devices as uh, well. On top I think... Uh, I think... This place has a public perception problem. Yeah. Now, <laughs> given my view of this place, yeah. it would be tempting for me to sit back and do nothing. And you know, I'm, I'm just not to cut into you, but knowing that I'm just sort of in the chair, being able to ask the questions in the past month, yes. I do get that public perception as well. Yeah. So I think there's a public expectation that when when they look at figures and see that special advisors were costing twice what they were costing in England and Wales, mm -hmm. they make an uncharitable conclusion about this place. Now, I think that in turn creates an obligation 
if we can do something about it, to do something about it. And that's why I'm motivated to say, I think, special advisors, with too many of them uh, in that particular office, let's reduce them. I think that's the public expectation. And I think special advisors have not had a good press through RHI. No. And uh, I don't think there'll be too many people out in the streets protesting if we reduce the number of special advisors. Uh, but that's not the test. The test is, is it the right thing or not? Mm -hmm. And I, think, I don't think it's defensible to have the same number of special advisors in the First Minister's office, uh, the, the First and Deputy First Minister's office, as it is in the whole world. Well, you have my support on that one, Andy. I would have to agree with you. Well, just, so, can I, can I, sure. Sorry, okay, Pat, just, one, just so quick one. It's on special advisors, so it's linked as well. Jim, when you were looking at um, creating the sort of looking at the special advisors, had you ever considered sort of averaging the amount of money per special advisor per elected representative and doing it across the regional parliaments as, as a basis, and then give a figure? No, short answer. But, but then give a figure which would be considerably less, obviously, than the two million pounds. But then it would be up to the the ministers to decide how they average that out because you could you could have 20 special advisors if you wanted if you paid them 20 grand each yeah well you mean cap the budget for special advisors correct yeah. and particularly it's the pension way. costs and the rest of it yeah another way okay chair, I'm sorry, chair, sorry. chair i'm not at all wishing to impede this i did agree to appear before the exact well, it's on the same right. subject but we we uh, we anticipated we might have been a bit uh, longer than that, and but sort of we. But well, we have we we have done that. Yes, sir. Sure, the, the, the executive office committee is is running late. Good. Yeah. Good. So you're not getting away that easy. <laughs> <laughs> so Pat. And well, it's, it's just to go back again to uh, the the electronic devices. I know that it's been well put down here, but I mean, I'm, I'm trying to look at a lot of people that just carry, I mean, to use a drinking term, you know, uh, bring your own bottle, bring your own <laughs> devices, uh, as we say. Uh, how would that fit in? I mean, I mean, Matthew has, has brought to it that, I mean, a lot of my communications with probably, I, I, I like the, the, the WhatsApp one, I don't do for anything that's on that official site, but I'm looking at the penalties, if they were used you know, on that, or uh, the, the harshness of a criminal penalty for something. I'm, I'm not asking it for it to be a trivial, but I'm looking at it, if you were at a meeting, as, as someone, as Matthew has already, or other ones have, have alluded to there as well, but, you know, it could be very simple to just hit that button, as Paul had said to you as well, too. And uh, it's on the criminal offence side that I find I just have a wee bit of a lot of concern. Well, uh, let me just repeat. The reason for thinking of a criminal offence at all is because of the evidence at RHI of how deliberately private devices were used to circumvent record keeping. And I think that's a serious issue. Yes. And therefore one that needs to be addressed. Uh, is it over the top to address it in this way? Well, I think with the reasonable, with the defence of reasonable cause, that mitigates it very considerably. And the fact that for any prosecution, it has to be in the public interest. So I think the obvious one-off use of your own whatever uh, for wholly innocent purposes is never going to be prosecuted nor should it be. But you have to have a criminal provision in order to be able to prosecute the ones that deserve to be prosecuted. If you don't have it, then they too escape. Uh, that's the same with any criminal offence. Uh, so, you know, I think it's a question of balance, but I think it's right to criminalise the conduct which is designed to circumvent uh, a proper record of something because the person who does it is deliberately trying to conceal something. I think that's right to have a criminal offence for that. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Okay, but uh, just a final one, Jim, before we let you go. Um, who have you consulted with so far? 
Well, uh, the first four clauses of the bill are a considerable reflection of a bill uh, I brought in 2015. Uh, in 2013, I brought the Special Advisors Bill, which went through, yeah. which created, uh, which prevented the people with serious criminal convictions, and it did create the statutory duty to have codes of conduct and codes of appointment. Um, before that, there wasn't. Uh, so that bill went through in 2013. Then I brought a bill in 2015, I believe it was, to reduce the number of spads and do the other things in the main that are in clauses one to four and that bill was defeated at second stage. And before I brought that bill, I had a consultation exercise uh, on those proposals, which was uh, very strongly supported. So that was the consultation. I didn't repeat that in respect of the, um, those first clauses. Uh, on clause five, I took the view that the assembly had already debated and decided on this. So I thought that was sufficient. And on the other clauses, uh, I took the view that these matters have been so widely ventilated in the public arena through the RHI that uh, there wasn't a necessity to consult further. I'd also make this point. When you bring a private member's bill, they fall into two categories. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you go to the bill's office and say, here is my idea, I want a bill on this, and they draft it up for you, then you're obligated to go through a formal consultative process. Mm -hmm. If you go to the bill's office with your bill already drafted yeah. and say, I want to introduce this, yeah. then you are not obligated to go through the, the consultation. consultation process. Yeah. And my bill was in the second category. I drafted it, I took it to the bills, I took it to the speaker's office, and all they had to do was decide it was within legislative competence, etc. And hence it gets here. Okay. Okay, Tim. Jim, thanks very much indeed. Okay, thank uh, you. Thank you very much indeed for your evidence. And go and enjoy yourself in the uh, executive office. Sure. And then come back for all the rest of the work you need to do this afternoon. I'll be here, but then be gone. I'd say. <laughs> Um, just finally, just before you go, Jim, if there's any further information we require, would you yeah. be happy to? Absolutely. Yeah. Tim, do you want a quick two minute break? Yep. Thank you. I'll make it, make it a five minute and back in here at quarter two. Yeah. Um, team, um, sort of the earlier on today, as I've already briefed, I met for the, I'm just coming into the record, I uh, met the chairpersons of the Committee for Finance, the Executive Officer of the Assembly, and Executive Review, Review Committee this afternoon. As provided for understanding order 64A as the main committees to which the bill of concern to consult and agree to which committee the bill should be referred to at the second stage. It was agreed the clauses in the bill are mainly of concern to the Committee of Finance and the Committee of the Executive Office, that, but on balance the bill is of more concern to the Committee of Finance, but that's not saying that the issues to come to it will not be sent to the Committee for the Executive Office, to Justice and to the other committees as required. Um, Therefore, the chairpersons have therefore agreed that should the bill pass the second stage, it will be referred to the Committee for Finance as the most appropriate statutory committee as provided for in Standing Order 33.1. Now, how long that will be, we don't know. We don't know where it is in the legislative process and the timescales and the rest of it, but I just wanted to inform of that there. Um, as a committee now, we need to agree whether it supports the general principles of the bill. If it does not support the general principles of the bill, or does not wish to form a view at this stage on whether it supports the general principles of the bill. I'm just going to go round and ask you individually on, the, on this point because I think it's quite important. But for me, the key to this is what happens in the RHI report and what comes out of the RHI report downstream. And to me, that I would look at that stage is I think it's probably too early for us to form a view on this bill, particularly until we know what actually comes out of RHI what's happening when we formally see the ministerial brief that comes out from the minister and some of the other issues that are out there as well. But I would just like to take your opinion going through. Pat, can I start off with you, please? Yeah, I suppose um, I, I think that people out there will and do want us to do better, and I would have broad support 
I do have reservations. There, there, there's plenty of room in order to change it and to mould it. Uh, I think um, Mr. Alice has already said that he would be willing to do it. So, but I, I feel I have a broad general support for it with, with the amendments which have to go into it and try and I'm a wee bit concerned about that criminal aspect of it, but that's where I am with the chair. Okay. I think I agree with you, Chair, that it's purely to form a view in that um, we, for, for a couple of reasons, one, we don't know what's in the Cochrane report, two, um, it is, well, largely because we don't know what's in the Cochrane report, two, I, I mean, I, I suppose I like pat the general intent of improving public confidence in um, the functioning of government here is welcome, but you know I would specifically want to get much more information and sort of on the idea of pro kind of creating what seemed like pretty, first of all, pretty onerous um, uh, requirements on all civil servants, all ministers, all, and secondly, creating what are pretty tough crim criminal creating a criminal sanction. That applies to any anyone who sends an email from their hotmail is a pretty big deal, mm -hmm. and so I think while agreeing with the general uh, the idea that we talk about this and this bill be considered, I don't think I'd want to form a view on, on support for it. So I agree with you. Okay. Yeah. I'd be supportive, subject to the Cochrane report. It's coming on the 13th of March. I'll be surprised if it paints the spads in a in a favourable light. Yeah. Um, so therefore, I think the way that he said, Jim has introduced this means that we can take into account all of Cochrane. Uh, and uh, the other thing I did was impressed that Jim, throughout his presentation, indicated a willingness to listen to the assembly in terms of amendment or, or making yeah. the bill stronger or indeed weaker. So yes. Um, give it a fair win, but we're all going to have to wait until what less than what three weeks away. Yeah, less than three weeks. Okay. So I'll come to you, Paul, just okay. after the end. Uh, well, just to say, I expressed uh, the view when talking to Mr. Alistair himself. I think it is premature. Uh, I think it is putting the cart before the horse, uh, and that in fact we are waiting on the RSI inquiry. And I do think too that the minister uh, to date uh, has suggested. Uh, Elements even uh, within uh, the present code of conduct as well. Uh, so I'm not in a position to support it. No. Okay. Sure. Sam, I think that the minister has taken action. We're waiting, which probably will be recommendations coming from, and I think that'll be suffice. Joe. And I agree with them. Okay. Paul. Um, I have a lot of sympathy for the intent of the bill and the substance of the bill. I think it's probably where we need to be going in the direction, but I believe that it's good practice for any committee about to scrutinise a bill that they do not form a view, even though we all might individually think it's the greatest piece of legislation out. I do think we have a process to conduct, and I think that it would be good practice not, as a committee not to form a view on any bill before we have scrutinised it. Okay, so... Sure. Uh, Sorry. Uh, I mean, to add to that, it's not that we support because we don't have it as it is there, but I mean, the of, of what it's trying to deliver and how it's trying to deliver, there lies the difference in it. But in the principles of it, yes, that's what I meant by I'm saying that I would be supportive of anything which gives us better governance. And there lies the proof of it as we work our way through it to find out. Does that reach that goal? Okay, so just to call less and sort of the sort of thinking we've got here, we have either three who are sort of, and I'll, I'll, I'll formally poll it in a second so we record it, so don't worry about that. But we've got three who would be generally no, we don't support the bill, and there's the, the rest of us here would be on the opinion that we don't wish to form a view at this stage because of where we are. Does that sort of represent where we're at? Yeah. 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 So just to formally record it, those who do not support the bill say aye. Uh, Ask you three. Yeah, three. Three. Show of hands, Chair. Three. Show, Show of hands, please. Yeah. Okay. And we do not wish to form a view at this stage of whether it supports the general principles of the bill. That's five. Yeah. Sorry, Chair. Just uh, to, to, to feel better now. To, to, to get this right, there, there would uh, have to be firstly a, a motion to a uh, not form a view at this stage. So that the motion would have to be uh, that the committee does not form a view on whether it supports the general principles of the bill. Okay. So we need a proposal for that motion. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Matthew proposes. Paul proposes. All those in favour say aye. 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 Those against? Aye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, I move on now to the written briefing from the Northern Ireland Civil Service, the key issues and priorities. 
Would you draw to members' attention to the paper submitted to the Committee for Consideration at page 110? I want to seek agreement that we forward this or to forward this written briefing paper to Northern Ireland Public Servants Alliance, who will give oral evidence on the 4th of March. Are we agreed? Yep. Yeah. And seek agreement to forward the NIPSA, the briefing paper received from the Pensions Division at the meeting on the 12th of February 2020. Are you content? Yes. Great. Great. Yep. Yeah. Uh, move on to Chairperson's business. Uh, draw members' attention, uh, tabled, uh, attention table to pages 6. It's a response from the Permanent Secretary to the letter from the Committee asking for an unredacted copy of the Minister's Issues document which followed the first day brief of the Committee. Um, the Minister has asked the Permanent Secretary to meet with the Chair and Deputy Chair of the Committee to discuss the first day brief and Department Rule Issues document provided. Look, team, I'm not happy with that. We as a Committee asked to see the first day brief. It's a question that we as the Committee wanted to raise. I think it's appropriate that if we're doing it, we do it as a committee. I am not generally speaking, and we'll, I'll communicate this back uh, with your agreement uh, to the through the day low. But when we're talking as a committee, it shouldn't be just the chair and the deputy chair. It should be the committee together, looking at these issues and trying to trying to do that as well. Sorry, sure. um, but who wrote to the minister? Who wrote? It? Was it yourself and Paul? Yeah. On behalf, you, on behalf of the committee. Did you say on behalf of the committee? Yeah. I would just be a wee bit sceptical, like, was it signed off the committee or was it signed off from yourselves? Because I'm on the health committee and that happens a lot, where they just meet with the chair and the deputy chair, and that's fine. I think particularly for this issue, because these were issues raised when the minister was here on the first day brief, and we all had questions on the first day brief. Mm -hmm. And the response, I think, should come to the whole of the whole of the whole of the committee. Look, I I I do not feel the issue was an issue was raised by the committee here, and I think I think it's a, a, a common courtesy and a practice that if we are raising an issue, it should come back to us. If there are specific issues that should be highlighted towards the chair and the deputy chair on things like that, I will come back to you and say, look, I think these should come to the chair and the deputy chair. But if we as a committee raised that issue. I think that's why it would be appropriate for the information that yeah. came back to us. But sort of pop. Yeah, I would agree with you, Chair. So if, if this was a, an outside body, a third party, uh, wanting to meet with the chair and the deputy chair, yep, you know, why burden all the members? Uh, and then, but if we were in that meeting and we said, oh, hold on, wait a minute, there's a, a bit of concern here, we would want to bring this to the committee. The fact that this bit of business, this transaction, has been through the committee by the very fact, I think it was me that asked the minister, will you release your first day brief? The minister had no problem with that at that day. No, he had said, look, yep, absolutely, it's been eight pages long and then whatever, and it's not very exciting, I think he said. So that was good. I think it's transparent, and I applaud the minister for that. But then, when this committee receives information that's heavily redacted, of course, as a scrutiny committee, the question we're going to ask is why. Now, if there's good reasons why things are redacted, we, we, we should take that uh, face value. But I think that you would have to scrutinise why every single piece is redacted. And there might be reasons that are quite appropriate, but there might be reasons that, that aren't. Uh, and I'm not sure that all of the redactions are in the same bracket. So I, I think it's good that this committee would pursue that. I think procedurally on the day I asked the Minister for the brief, the Minister says, yep, happy day, uh, to do that, and then probably the chair might say all agreed and we would all go yeah so that's you know <coughs> there, there will be times whenever members or chairs or deputy chairs or individual members wants the committee to do something and others might say no the example being the research paper uh, from the first meeting and then let's have the debate if you want in the committee and then thrash it out and see where we go from there uh, but, but this is on scrutiny and I don't think any member you know, should should turn their face away from questions about transparency, um, and that for me that's what it is. What's in the, what's behind that redacted shield? I don't know. Is it something important? Maybe not. But I think we need to know. Sorry, Paul. I was going to ask. Um, was the so the letter says it? I'm sort of reminding myself. Did the, was the reason the department gave for the redactions FOI considerations? What did that? What was the explanation they gave, or have they given us an explanation? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Um, the uh, the redacted report came with a separate document outlining the the uh, FOI reasons why 
it was redacted. Now, some of them were very straightforward. For example, I think there were personal email addresses yes. or personal contact details yeah. in there, which under GDPR would yeah. 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 couldn't be released. But uh, there were others in there that, that seemed to be uh, FOA, uh, not being released under FOA for various reasons. Uh, not being released under meaning that they were citing FOI legislation as their reason for not doing it, as in... Uh, it my understanding of it is that th this was a document that uh, was being released publicly, but it was also released, it was released to the committee in advance that, and that the redactions were just the same as the one that was released right, publicly. Right, okay. So they made, as, as a matter of business, they published it into the FOI section of the finance, finance the DF website, DOF website, and said this is the first day brief with redactions. So they basically gave us the, F the person that the version they give to the F right. so, yeah. someone who's FOI. And is there, sorry, um, Clark, to be um, quizzing you on this, but is there is there a specific bit of legislation or hardly legislation, but a specific bit of guidance which says statutory committees? Well, you say it's sort of alluded to it here. The statutory committee should have a. Well, it, it's not a, in, in itself. It's not been released publicly. Therefore, freedom of information wouldn't normally be a, a valid reason. I mean, there, there are, the, a, for example, a, some committees would, in, in an email, a, issue information to a committee, and in the email they would say the committee should be aware that this wouldn't be released under FOI and outline the reasons. For example, it might be policy and development. Yeah, I mean, personally, I think it's. It's reasonable to ask a question, at least, of it, as to why we've had. Yeah, that, that, again, that, that, that's the concern. Is yeah, uh, I mean, in this in the new world of openness and transparency, I it seems yeah. in the context of a of our committee having had to do a crash course in um, accelerated passage. <laughs> and all the rest yeah, of it, I don't think uh, you can see where we're coming. You see where the, the department will want and would. Question as to whether it was a you know <coughs> the minister or had not much to do with you know, he may not have had a huge amount to do with the um, no. the decision to redact anything but it's I think it's reasonable for us to say you're not giving us this information we, we require more detailed explanation as to why hmm. sorry chair my point wasn't about the redacted information I do agree with that but it was just the pettiness of saying we want this information. Department Secretary coming back and saying, no, I want, I'll want. i meet with you and the Deputy Chair, and then you saying, oh, no, I want you to ask for the, to meet with the whole committee. You know, no, no, so, no, so it, no, it's not, nothing petty about it, Gemma. It's not, it's, it's not, this is not petty. It's the fact that, and this is not getting at the Minister, because you know, oh, I think the Minister would, I think, I think, yeah, of course he is, Connor, you know, but the reality was that the Department decided that they would redact information yeah. without a good reason to come to the committee. Yeah. If, they do, if, if they're, if they're doing that with the first day brief, Gemma, yeah. you're out sort of and no, I doesn't sit at all. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, I definitely ask for the information, but just... Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not uh, it's, we're not being petty about this, but, you know, and it might just be GDPR issues or other issues, yeah. but yeah. not to be kept informed. Yeah, no, just no, yeah. makes me feel quite nervous. Yeah. No, it's fine. Okay, cheers. Thank you. Sure, is that then agreed to contact yes. the department to ascertain the reasons why the meeting has been asked? Yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, move on to the next one, uh, correspondence, consider the following pieces of correspondence. Uh, following a request to the Department of the Committee on the 5th of February 2020 regarding land registry fees, the response can be found at page 166. Any comments? Uh, next one, uh, following a request to the Department of the Committee on the 5th of February, Regarding rating debt, the response by the department is page 168. Any comments? Are we content? Um, correspondence with Hospitality Ulster, page 176. Um, I have a concern, and um, when we were being given evidence by the Land and Property Services, and I know Pat, that you may wish to uh, yeah. make an interjection as well, but. My, con my concern was the way the evidence was being presented and particularly how LPS uh, used the word about rumour, which I didn't think was appropriate being given uh, to a, a committee of the Northern Ireland Assembly. But I also um, was concerned about the implications that there'd been a lack of flow of information between particularly Hospitality Ulster and the uh, LPS. LPS's, or sort of, uh, Ulster Hospitality has written to me 
as the chair of the committee and has written to the committee as well. I think it's appropriate that, having seen that letter that's come through to us, uh, I'm going to ask to forward that correspondence directly to the department for comment. But are any, and Pat, you'll probably want to come in here, is there anything you'd like to? Well, I do, and I, I, thanks very much, Chair. It's just that, again, I do want to rehash what we've talked about before, but there's a genuine fear out there with this written uh, system as it affects public houses, and it's to do with, with what their turnover. And, and, and how that readable mechanism, if you like, sits with the trade. Um, there has not been that engagement. Uh, I believe that this is engagement that, is, uh, that they have taken the United Kingdom, uh, probably mostly England model, and tried to bring it here in order to fix uh, the problem that they here, have here with the rating. 60% of all pubs in Belfast are now rented, so it wouldn't be that difficult to take a general renting and divide it by 60. It would give a far better. And I was going to, I, I don't know if it's possible or, or, or not for us as, as that committee. I'm looking at what's happening in uh, the, the, the rate, the reveal 2020. For us, I would ask could we meet? Would it be time for us? To have a, a small delegation from hus from the hospitality sector in order to come and hear their side. We've heard the side from the rating, but we have not heard their side and all of the fears which are out there. Now this is a huge industry that employs thousands of people, all right? And it tends to be very small chair. It tends to be one or two operators. I'm not even going to go in the license the isolated areas and the community and the aspects what it does, the build up that it has for our, our, our tourism. So it have it can have a real huge impact if there is any closure of public houses. Uh, I don't want to give us a whole lesson, but I promise you when I went into the bar first there were thousands of pubs more. We have lost over half of them. And we and there is a fear out there of the rateable valuation of the set. And would it be possible, and would the committee be minded? Now, I have not spoken with them. I have not, but when I seen the letter as it comes through, I think that it would be in our interests. Uh, to, um, Pat has made a proposal that we have, let's say, um, Hospitality Ulster, or uh, uh, is it Hospitality Ulster? Uh, it is. The Hospitality Ulster are even the small business. The to come and talk to us about yeah, the yes, that is small business. A joint. Small. Or probably a jump or anything, yeah. yeah. Uh, Just through the chair, <clears throat> could I ask, um, what would be the purpose of them meeting with this committee? I think it's specifically around, to, 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 and I'm not sort of trying to talk across yeah. part, but it's specifically the issue on, this is a rating issue, yeah. and it's how the rates and revaluation, it sits with the Department of Finance, and it's how the revaluation how was conducted, because the complaint as I read from the correspondence that came from uh, Hospitality Ulster is the fact that LPS said there was no engagement with the hospitality sector, mm -hmm. whereas they say that they did look at, um, they engaged an economist, they engaged, they were willing to discuss sort of across sort of the whole of the, the sector. It is a substantial rating issue, but it's a specific rating issue that deals directly with LPS. We're not talking about the other issues which probably sit with the Department of the no, Economy. That's right, not this is specifically a rating issue. And but that's why I wonder, like that, uh, are we in a position then to instruct, say, the likes of Land and Property Services to turn around to change maybe the direction that they're moving in as far as the determination of rates that are concerned? Should it not be to some other body that they should be addressing their concerns rather than to, rather than to us here in the Finance Committee? So, I believe, Mr. McHugh, we took information from the rating division. We listened to what they had to say. That was factually incorrect. And we're talking here about transparency. I believe that we have an obligation in order to hear the other side of that coin, just for ourselves, here on this finance committee. I believe that that would be good practice. Yeah. Well, sorry, just, just, uh, sorry, just talking to Jim and the clerk. I think the first role of this committee, there is definitely an issue here. Mm. And I think the first thing is we need to inform ourselves to form a view. Now, if we can inf inform ourselves of the view and we come to a recommendation, which we can as a committee, we can make a recommendation if there is a significant issue here. 
But I, I, the problem I have at the moment is that we have evidence from land and property, and then we've had a response from a major sector of our economy who are unhappy with what was being said as evidence is here. I think it's just right, it's right for our completeness that we get all the information that we have, and I think that's appropriate for our committee. Uh, I have no difficulty with that aspect of it, but just even one of you make the comment, Pat, about uh, what we received from land and property services was incorrect. I'm not that sure of that correct in itself. Uh, I think that what one could do in terms of land and property services, if you looked at uh, the yardstick that they were actually using in order to determine rates, uh, that one could question that. But uh, again, too, is it this committee that questions that, and can we actually influence and change that? So that I ask that question purely, like, is this the appropriate committee for them to be addressed this concern to? And is it fundamentally down to that issue, i.e. of the way it is that they have determined readable value for licensed premises? I know what they were doing yes. in the likes of turnover and elements such as that. So is that the case? Yeah. I think, Chair, that if we spoke with them, there is a mechanism there which is much more um, trade uh, agreeable, if you like, among the, the majority of trade. And I've already said it, that 60% of whatever public houses are in Belfast are now out in rent. I believe that we have this information. Uh, they, they have said that the public house sector were not willing to give them the information. I have spoken with them. They told me that they are willing to, to engage with that, but it is the format of which they're trying to do. This is a completely different set up to what happens in England where one, one large brewer can employ or have 1,000 pubs. Here it tends to be single operators and family operators and going on for a long time. Now, I have no vested interest in this bar I worked in the industry and I believe that it would be hmm. good for ourselves, good for our own knowledge to at least right this wrong which has been given to them and the information that we have got. Mm. And just as a matter of fact, you're in a very powerful position. You sit on the finance committee. You can make an enormous difference. And um, I think th here is one example of something we could potentially do. But you are a very powerful person, and you can make a big difference to a lot of people's and lives. Chair, if this goes through as it is, I believe this will wreak havoc on that sect on that sector, and it will affect the greater tourism. Perspective that we have here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Content. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Chair, just to recap, the committee is is agreeing to a joint briefing of Hospitality Ulster and the Federation of Small Business, yeah. and also to forward the correspondence to the, the Department for Comment. Department, Department yeah. for Comment. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Sir. Cheers. Thanks very much, uh, sort of if we move on, team, to move on to the forward work programme, I draw members' attention to page 188 for issues to be scheduled under the forward work programme. I seek agreement that members are content to be scheduled and update the forward, forward work programme. Um, just as an issue, um, the report of RHI inquiries we've heard today is going to be published on the 13th of March. Um, I think it's appropriate once the department has had time to consider what's in it. So what I don't want to do is hold the department in here the next week and say, what are you doing about it, when a thousand-page document, which they're going to have to have some time to consider some of the issues. And I think I would rather get a response that has considered all the significant factors or factors that need to be raised later on to do that. So looking at the work programme, and I think what was the date we were looking at, Jim? Was it the 1st uh, of April, Chair? For, uh, presented the 1st of April. So... Um, I was going to ask, would the members be content to ask the department to provide a written briefing on the findings and recommendations of the report as they relate to the department finance and time for a committee meeting on the 1st of April? So that gives them time to consider it properly. And then to receive oral evidence from the department on the 22nd of April at the committee's first meeting following the Easter recess. So that would be appropriate time for people to consider the sort of the, the issues that are were in front of us. Content? Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much, Eddie. Yeah. Uh, We've stopped killing rainforests, so uh, printed packs will no longer be issued from this week. Has everybody got their laptop? 
Or their yes. tablet? Yeah. Brilliant. Jim, did you actually get a new one, or are you still using your old I'm using the thing? old one, but I, I'm a bit of a Luddite. But I'm moving on to the new old fangled wonderful one for next week. The question I have to ask is the Chair, have you been provided with a new one? I tablet? have, but remember, I do have the old smoke. <laughs> the old hand, so therefore, I'm a wee bit behind the times. It's, 20, it's almost about to turn 20. <laughs> hey! Right. Yeah. Uh, I haven't been informed of any other business. Any other business from yeah. the. Sure. Okay. Oh, sir, Pat. Uh, first of all, I have to apologise for I'm bringing this this week. I meant to bring it last week, but I was invited, I think, along with a lot of other MLAs, to go to a meeting at the hotel over at Jaws Bridge. And when I went there, I tend to be there on my own, but there were at least 200, 240 different businesses from all over Northern Ireland were there and represented. And it was to do with like a pyramid selling scheme on a plasma screen. Now, I know that we've agreed to speak to the, uh, the small business sector when it comes in. Would it be possible on the side of that just for them to try and explain? I, I believe that they're, they're, they're paying out £300 per month for something that they cannot lift. Are we able to at least listen to that? I believe that it is, it's, it's impacting on their, their businesses. The company that was selling them, the, the advertising has gone bankrupt and it's impossible for them uh. to get out of these contracts. Is there, I mean, I, I, I was asking, is there anything or any way, do you think, Chair, that we might be able to at least listen or maybe give some advice on how to address I it? I think, just bearing in my, my previous experience, that sits within the remit of the Department of Economy. Right. But with your approval, yeah. we'll write to the Department of Economy to, or the Committee for the Department of the Economy to investigate this. Yes. And potentially, could we also info address it to the uh, Justice Committee? Just yeah. because I think there are, yeah. uh, not, not, I don't want to stray into yeah, anything okay, that I'll potentially be, but I understand we should, we should probably write to both. Are we content with that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Chair, your party colleague, uh, Mr. Stewart, is well versed on it as well. Okay. I think most of us are. Because most of you are now. Yeah. Uh, Approached right. this issue yeah. as well too. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thanks for the thank shortest you. meeting we've had yeah, so far, record. and I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Okay. Okay. Thank you. More meetings like it. Cheers. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. This is the Northern 